What do you do when you get good news? How do you respond? Well, I imagine you rejoice, right? You celebrate even. You text or you call those who you, whom you love and you tell them the good news. You make a beeline to Instagram or Facebook and tell all those who don't know you well about this good news. You're not going to believe this. I, I got the job. You, you ace the final exam. Well, let's go party, right? Let's go out and celebrate. Look, everyone, I'm engaged. This is the good news that the good news that we rejoice in. Well, and these are the normal responses to good news. You know what's not a typical response to good news? Obedience. We don't typically think of good news as something to be submitted to or obeyed, but but guess what? When it comes to the gospel, when it comes to the best news ever, God's news of salvation for the world, that is exactly what it is designed to accomplish. It's not merely good news to rejoice in and to celebrate. The gospel is designed to bring out faith-filled obedience among all the peoples of the world who gladly bow their knee to Jesus. Friends, this is the message of these opening verses in Paul's letter to Romans, one of the main themes of the entire book. So would you please turn to Romans chapter 1. Romans 1, it's on page 939 of the Bibles underneath your seats. Friends, if you're new to Christianity, uh, those big numbers on the page we call chapters, and those little verses we call verses. Uh, we'll be looking at Romans 1, 1 to 7 this morning. Friends, today we begin studying what many believe to be the greatest letter ever written. It's the, uh, it's the Mount Everest of the New Testament, the book of Romans. So as we go through this series in this, in this epistle, uh, the trek is not going to be easy. Uh, Romans is theologically dense. It contains plenty of, of hard doctrines. However, uh, I believe that the vistas, the views that, that Romans offers of the grace of God in Christ are in many respects unparalleled in the entire New Testament. Uh, Romans is a book that's been used mightily by God throughout church history. It's shaped the lives and ministries of men like Augustine and Martin Luther and many others. And not just church history broadly. Romans has shaped the history of this church. The doctrines of grace contained in Romans were used by God several years ago to, to put our church on a trajectory toward better theological health when my predecessor John Filkey preached through Romans from 2008 to, to 2010 or so. Our, our current name, Redeeming Grace Church, reflects how Romans has impacted us as a church all those years ago. Romans is an earth-shattering, church-shaping type of book. It's a book that in many ways is foundational to understanding biblical Christianity as it outlines God's plan of salvation for all the world through Jesus. And I'm excited for us to begin studying it together this morning. Uh, we're going to go through the book of Romans, kind of similar to how we've been going through Matthew. So each fall semester, we go through Matthew. Now, each spring semester, we're going to begin working through the book of Romans and do something different during the, the summertime to kind of bridge those two series. Uh, hopefully, learning Romans a, a chunk at a time like this will help keep the book fresh uh, for us and be manageable for us as we work through it. Now, before we uh, start verses 1 to 7. Before we dive in, I want to give you, as I often do at the beginning of a new series, a new book of the Bible, an overview of Romans. Okay, let's look at the map together before we start to drive. I, I know we don't have to do that nowadays. We have Siri or the Waze app or whatever to tell us where to go while we're driving, uh, but it's always good to look at a map before you start going to know where we're headed. The author of Romans is the Apostle Paul. Although, chapter 16 tells us the one who actually put pen to paper was a man named Tertius. Okay, so Paul dictated Romans. Tertius actually wrote it down. Um, and in case you're new to Christianity, let me just tell you a little bit about this man, Paul. Um, Paul was formerly a Jewish rabbi who hated Christianity. He persecuted Christians in the early days after Jesus' resurrection. Uh, but one day while on the road to Syria, to Damascus, uh, he had a life-changing encounter with the risen Jesus, who then commissioned 
Paul to take the gospel to the Gentiles. And so that's exactly what Paul began to do. He began to take the gospel to the non-Jewish world. He traveled all around ancient Rome, telling people about the risen king that he had encountered, forming Jesus' followers into new communities called churches. And given the newness of Christianity, what Paul would do is he would occasionally write letters back to these new churches to help foster their faith or to answer questions. Uh, Many of Paul's letters were uh, then recognized by the early church as sacred scripture, and and Romans is, is one of those letters. Paul wrote Romans late in his career, around AD 57 or so, toward the end of his third missionary journey. Uh, We're almost certain that Paul wrote Uh, Romans from the city of Corinth. Uh, We're given clues about that in chapter 16. So Paul, at the very beginning of 16, mentions Phoebe as the sister who carried his letter to Rome, as well as in that chapter, he mentions Gaius and Erastus, who were with him at the time of his writing. And all three of those folks from other parts of the scripture we know were from Corinth or the surrounding region around Corinth. Now, one thing to keep in mind about Paul's letters in the New Testament They were all written to specific churches or groups of churches, specific believers to address specific situations, and Romans is no different. Uh, You know, because of Romans' theological thickness, I think we often think of it like, you know, this is Paul's systematic theology that he just wrote because he wanted to set down his, his theology. But really, that's not what Paul set out to do when he wrote Romans. Instead, I I think that that the soaring theology that we find in Romans is meant to accomplish something very, very specific among the group of churches there in Rome. Although Paul never states the purpose of his letter explicitly, he implies it throughout. And one of those purposes, friends, is to unify in the gospel both the Gentile and Jewish believers in the churches in Rome, the, the capital of the Roman Empire. Now, we know from the book of Acts, also from the Roman historian Suetonius, that, uh, you know, the Church of Rome had existed for some time. It was likely started by Jewish Christians, then, who then began to evangelize Gentiles. But in AD 49, okay, not like, you know, 1949, AD 49, right, the, the Roman Emperor Claudius uh, expelled all the Jews from Rome. We find that in Acts 18 confirmed, uh, including Jewish believers who had been in these churches. But five years later, after Claudius died, the Jews were allowed to return. And when they did, well, naturally, what did they find? They found a church that was now largely Gentiles and then very non-Jewish in custom and practice. So perhaps, friends, you can now, just knowing that little tidbit of information, you can understand Paul's command for, let's say, in Romans 15, when he he commanded this church, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. By Paul's day, the Roman church was divided. People disagreed about how to follow Jesus best. You know, you could imagine maybe maybe they were debating about whether non-Jewish Christians should celebrate the Sabbath or eat kosher or be circumcised. And so, so Paul wrote this letter to accomplish a few things. He wanted this church to be unified in the gospel, and he knew that the only way that this church could become united in Christ wasn't just by like some apostolic fiat, you know, like be unified. No, he knew that the only way that they could be united was in the gospel. They must be together in and for the gospel of Jesus. And friends, Paul's letter is meant to accomplish that in our church. As we go through this gospel or this epistle together, he wants to further unite our church in the gospel. But beyond that, Paul had a a very practical aim, which he states in chapter 15. If you read Romans 15, Paul states it very clearly. He wants the churches in Rome to be the staging ground for his future mission to take the gospel to the western edge of the world in Spain. The gospel had never gone there. Paul had never been there. And so Paul knew that if if division marked these churches, if these churches were disunited, they would be very poor missions mobilizers. Friends, it's, it's unity in the gospel that propels the mission of the gospel. It's unity in the gospel that propels the mission of the gospel. It was true back then for the Romans, and it's true for us now here at RGC. Okay, so that's that's why Paul wrote it. He wrote this 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 theological treatise, what it feels like, this full explanation of the gospel to unify the church for the sake of the mission of the gospel to where it had never gone before. 
Now, you can see from the insert in your bulletin uh, that this letter of Romans has a certain structure to it, okay? I will not look at this structure often as we were in this preaching series, so maybe tuck it in your Bible, take a picture of it, whatever you want to do, um, but you can see there that Romans has a frame and a body. The frame is the introduction and conclusion of the letter, and it contains very similar themes about the gospel and the obedience of faith among the nations for the glory of God. And then the body of the letter really has four main parts, four main movements. You can see them laid out there in the handout. The gospel, in the first four chapters or so, Paul says, reveals God's righteousness. And this gospel, which reveals God's saving righteousness, it creates a new people who then experience all the benefits of God's saving righteousness, which Paul lays out in in chapters 5 to 8. All of which... This, this gospel, the saving righteousness of God, which then God's people experience the benefits of, all of this fulfills God's promise to Israel and vindicates God's righteousness. We'll learn that in those chapters 9 through 11. And understanding this gospel, the saving righteousness of God, and all these, all these things, well, then God's people begin to live out its implications. They live together in the gospel, and that's what Paul covers at the end of the book. Okay? So there you have it, friends. We have traced a map of Romans in 10 minutes. Okay, now let's begin to drive. Okay, let's begin to drive through the book. Let's read together Romans 1, 1 to 7. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by His resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring out the obedience of faith for the sake of His name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Now, what we just read is simply Paul's salutation in the letter. We still do this when we write letters today, right? Dear so-and-so, to whom it may concern. Well, in the ancient world, it was no different. You might think of Paul's uh, salutation here in verses 1 to 7 as kind of his apostolic howdy to the church in Rome. Now, verses 1 and 7, verses 1 and 7 are kind of the, the meat and potatoes of the hello. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Verse 7, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and, God and called to be saints, grace and peace, and so on. And that's very similar to how Paul begins his other letters that we have in the New Testament. But that's not all there is in these verses, is there? I mean, sandwiched between the basic apostolic greeting is, is, is this tight, bundle of supercharged gospel theology. Like every phrase packs a punch. You can understand why preachers like preach Romans like a phrase at a time and take 18 years to get through the book, right? It is just so deep and full. Well, why did Paul pack all these these things into these first opening statements? Well, maybe it's because the Roman churches did not know Paul well. Romans is the one letter that Paul wrote to a church that he had never planted before. He, did never been, he had never visited Rome that we know of since he became a Christian. And so Paul wants to assure them of his God-given authority to proclaim God's gospel. And this gospel that he's proclaiming is, is designed and, and aimed to bring out the obedience of faith among all the nations of which they are included. Here's the main idea. Here's the main idea of these first seven verses of Romans that I trust will be the main idea of the sermon today. God has announced his gospel so that all nations would obey it through faith for the glory of Jesus Christ. God has announced his gospel, his good news, his saving message of the reign of Jesus so that all nations would obey it through faith for the glory of Jesus Christ. Friends, three points this morning. God's announcement of his gospel. We see that in verses 1 to 4. Secondly, God's aim for his gospel, verses 5 and 6. And last, our abundance in his gospel. It was really trying to alliterate hard there at the end. Our abundance 
in God's gospel. Beloved, I pray that our study today throughout this series would help us see as God unveils for us the glory of his gospel in Christ Jesus and that we would indeed respond joyfully to it in the obedience of faith. Number one, God's announcement of his gospel. Look at the text. Paul identifies himself in three ways in verse one. Number one, as a servant of Christ Jesus. Number two, called to be an apostle. Number three, set apart from the gospel of God. What he's doing there, he's identifying his master, his office, and his task. His master, his office, and his task. So first of all, he identifies his master. Paul says, I am merely a servant. I'm a slave. I'm a bondservant of King Jesus, the one who rescued and redeemed him from the mastery of sin and death. You know, there's no question that that Paul wants the Romans to understand his commission as an apostle. He's trying to explain why they should listen to his message. But notice what note he begins, he sounds to begin the letter. What note he sounds to begin the letter is not authority, but humility. Paul calls himself, I'm just a servant of Christ. And this is the case for all of us, isn't it? Every one of us are nothing more than servants of Christ Jesus. God forbid that we should make much of ourselves. We're merely servants of a great master and Lord. The second description designates Paul's office. He's called to be an apostle. Now, this word apostle is a distinctly Christian word in our kind of modern vocab. I doubt you'll hear it much outside the the church. But in, in the ancient world, to be an apostle simply meant that you were an official representative or an official messenger of someone. So you might be an apostle of a dignitary or an apostle of your boss or an apostle of someone in government. Apostle literally just means one who is sent. In the New Testament, though, the the predominant way that this word apostle is used is not in the generic messenger sense, sense, but in the official representative of Jesus sense. To be an apostle was to be one of Jesus' chosen pillars for the early church, to proclaim and preach the gospel and establish his church. Friends, not just anyone could be an apostle. There were certain criteria that we find throughout the New Testament. First of all, an apostle had to have personally seen the resurrected Jesus. And second, an apostle had to be personally appointed by Jesus to be an official witness and messenger of his resurrection. Okay? Had to have seen the risen Christ and appointed by Jesus for the role. Okay? So does that mean that there can be apostles like this today? No. No, that was an office that had a a shelf life to it. And Paul met both the the criteria, didn't he, right? Acts 9 records that while on the road to Damascus to persecute Christians, the resurrected Jesus stopped Paul in his tracks, and he gave him the new birth, and he commissioned him to be an apostle to the Gentiles. So there there you have it. He saw the risen Christ, commissioned by the risen Christ. That's why when Paul swings back in verse 5, look at it, to talk about the aim of his ministry, he writes, through whom, through Jesus, we have received grace and apostleship. Like for Paul, it was all packaged together, wasn't it? When he saw Jesus on the road to Damascus, he was transformed by grace. He received apostleship by grace to be an official representative of the king. Paul wants these believers in Rome to understand, (laughs) guys, I did not self-select my office, right? Paul did not, uh, you know, he didn't apply for his role on ZipRecruiter, didn't put out his resume on the ancient version of LinkedIn. No, he was called, Paul says. He was set apart. Verse 5 says that he received grace and apostleship, all passive verbs, Paul's making it very clear his office as an apostle was given to him by Jesus. Let's just briefly consider this idea of being called. Paul says, I was called to be an apostle. In all of Paul's writings in the New Testament, to be called doesn't mean to be invited. It means to be summoned by God or the Lord Jesus, like, like a king would summon someone to do his bidding. In Paul's theological vocabulary, calling, whether it's to salvation or whether it's through the office like an apostle, that call is effective. It is sovereign. 
God's call does not fail. Indeed, it cannot fail. You cannot hear the call of God and think, ah, no, I'm good. No, no, it is an effective summons that works irresistibly in the human heart. Paul had been sovereignly summoned by King Jesus to be his apostle. Now, why does this matter, right? Why does it matter? Well, it matters a ton because it means that the churches in Rome were obligated to listen to Paul's message. We today, Redeeming Grace Church, 2,000 years downstream, are obligated to listen to Paul's message because ultimately the Apostle Paul's message is King Jesus' message because Paul was chosen by Jesus to be his apostle. To listen to Paul is to listen to our Savior and Lord speaking to his church. So in verse 1, Paul wrote of his master, of his office, and now finally of his task. He is set apart for something very specific, which he calls the gospel of God. The word gospel simply means good news. It's shorthand for the message of God's salvation for the world. Friends, what do you do with good news? Well, you announce it, right? You proclaim it. And Paul understood that Jesus had set him apart for this very task. Perhaps Paul was reflecting on the words of Isaiah 52, 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Isaiah's good news was Paul's message. It's the message of God's saving reign through Christ. Paul calls it God's gospel. It's his. God is the origin of the good news. He is the content of the good news. It's God's gospel. Friends, ultimately, Paul does not want to tell us about himself. Paul wants to tell you about God's gospel. It's like he's saying, the only reason I want you to listen to me it's because I want you to grasp the gospel of God in Jesus Christ. Say, so John, what is this gospel? What is God's message of good news for the world? Well, put most simply, the gospel of God is the good news that despite our sin and rebellion against our holy creator, Jesus, God's son, lived the life that we should have lived. He died and he rose again in the place of sinners. And that God will rescue you from your sin and from his wrath if you will turn and trust in Jesus. It's an astonishing message of a God so full of goodness and mercy and kindness that when Adam rebelled against him in the beginning, God didn't wipe humanity off the planet. He could have, but he didn't. Instead, in love, he, hatched, he had hatched an eternal plan to redeem his fallen creatures and bring them back into a right relationship with himself. This is the gospel of God, and it forms Paul's task. He is set apart to proclaim this message. Now, friends, I'm sure you're already getting a sense of how thick Romans is because all that we just discussed, it's in verse 1, okay? Paul's intro is just getting started. When Paul mentions in verse 1 being set apart to proclaim the gospel of God, it's like that thought catapults him uh, into reflecting on the significance of this gospel in the following verses. Okay, The first thing that Paul wants you to know about this gospel, look at verse 2, he says that it's attested by the Old Testament scriptures. Paul says, which of this gospel, which he, God, promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. And the gospel message that Paul and the apostles proclaimed wasn't a novel invention that they came up with, right? God revealed his gospel first throughout the thousands of years that the Old Testament Scriptures were being written, through all the promises and, and patterns and prophecies contained in the Old Testament, God announced the gospel ahead of time. And now... In Christ Jesus, the gospel is God doing what he said he would do. He kept his promises of salvation, that the seed of a woman, right, the, the, the offspring of Abraham, the, the royal son of David, he would come and save and redeem and rescue, and indeed he has. Friends, the, the message of Jesus, it doesn't change the message of the Old Testament, but Jesus is the key to understanding the Old Testament. He's the key that unlocks the door. Jesus told his disciples this very thing on the road to Emmaus after his resurrection, according to Luke 24. He says, it all points to me. 
Jesus is the mystery of God's gospel concealed for long ages, now fully revealed. Paul writes in verse 3 that God's gospel, attested in God's scriptures, concerns God's Son. And here we reach what really is the heart of Paul's greeting and the heart of the gospel. God's gospel is the gospel of His Son, one with whom God has a, re a unique relationship as Father and Son. Now, if you're a Christian, or even if you're not, when you hear this phrase, His Son, God's Son, you think to yourself, ah, that's Jesus. And of course, you're not wrong. You're very right. All you have to do is just keep reading this text, right? Paul says explicitly at the end of verse 4 that Jesus Christ, our Lord, is the Son of verse 3. And I'm guessing that in addition to thinking of Jesus as the Son, what comes to your mind when you hear that phrase, the, uh, the Son of God, is Jesus' deity. That He is in fact God. And again, you're very right about that. Just again, in this passage alone, the, the fact that Paul talks about God's Son and then begins to tell us about all the things that happened during Jesus' earthly life, I think implies the Son's pre-existence. The Son's deity. The Son is, in fact, the second person of the eternal God. Jesus said in John 10.30, I and my Father are one. In John 14.9, he said, Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Our Christology is built upon the full deity and full humanity of Jesus. As we so often confess together in the Nicene Creed, we believe that Jesus Christ is God from God, light from light, true God from true God. However, I want to suggest this morning that this term God's Son that we see in verse 3, it's kind of a multidimensional word, theologically speaking. It's not, it's not flat. It's 3D, right? There's a big difference, right, between watching Mickey Mouse on a cartoon and then going to Disneyland and giving Mickey a hug, at least for my kids. Big difference. Disneyland makes cartoon characters come alive. And I, I think that's how we should conceive of this phrase, God's Son, it's 3D. Because here's the deal. Although the first thing that pops into our mind when, you, when we hear the term God's Son is Jesus, it would not have been that way for the, for the ancient Jews. Well, let's just say that a Jewish Christian in one of these Roman churches invited an unbelieving Jew to the service at which this letter from Paul was being read. Okay, just hypothetically. And they hear the letter being read, and they hear Paul set apart for the gospel, which he promised beforehand through his, his prophets and the Holy Scriptures concerning his son. Guess what would have come to the mind of that Jew? Who is the son to them? Israel. Or perhaps Israel's king. Throughout the, the Old Testament, Israel was referred to as God's son. So think of God's word to Moses before the Exodus. Exodus 4.22, Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. And I say to you, let my son go, that he may serve me. The people of Israel had that special father-son relationship with the Lord through the gift of redemption, the grace of the covenant. And then as the covenants narrowed, Israel's king, the one who represented them and protected them before the Lord, was referred to as God's son. Even in God's covenant with King David about the future Messiah, he says of that coming eternal king, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And so, friends, what Paul writes here, <laughs> what Paul writes here is mind-blowing. I think clearly what he has in view is not the nation corporately, but an individual specifically. And at the end of verse 4, he tells us who he's talking about. It's Jesus Christ, our Lord. He's God's Son. Jesus summarizes and embodies and fulfills all that Israel was called to be. And if we're right about this, He's the, also the, the King Messiah, right? Long promised to reign over his people and bring about their salvation. He's the true Israel, and he's the true king. He's God's son. Now, Paul wants us to see two things specifically about God's son, our Lord Jesus. In fact, 
He presents these two things in parallel. Look at verse 3. We're going to be in our text in Romans, guys. I hope we always are, but you've got to have your nose in the Word when you're reading Romans, okay? Look at verse 3. Who was, the Son was, descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by His resurrection from the dead. Okay, do you see the parallel construction? Descended from David according to the flesh, declared to be God's Son according to the Spirit. It's not hard to understand that first part. Jesus, the man, came from David's bloodline. Both Mary and Joseph actually were descended from David. And Joseph is from the royal line of kings from David's line. And so their, their son, Mary by birth, Joseph through adoption, their son Jesus is the true and rightful heir of David's throne. This is good news that we just celebrated at Christmas time of the incarnation, the son of David came. The Messiah King promise from David's life came. God kept his promises. King Jesus is that, that King Messiah. But what about that second phrase? That this son was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. What does that mean? Well, here's what it can't mean. Okay, here's what it cannot mean. It cannot mean that Jesus became the Son of God by His resurrection from the dead. Cannot mean that. There are those who have taught that throughout the history of the church. And we understand that to be the, the heresy of what's called adoptionism. That Jesus wasn't truly God eternally, but was adopted as God's Son at either His baptism or His resurrection. Friends, if Jesus isn't truly and eternally God, He cannot save us or forgive us or restore us to God. He is not worthy of your worship or your trust if Jesus is not truly and eternally God. Remember, Paul has already declared Jesus to be the Son. So you could kind of rephrase it like this, couldn't you? Concerning his Son, who was declared to be the Son of God in power. The Son was declared to be the Son of God. He was already the Son, <laughs> But something happened at Jesus' resurrection in which he is now declared, or that word is better translated, appointed. He was appointed to be the Son of God in power. It speaks of a new dimension or a higher rank to Jesus' sonship. And again, friends, Paul is not talking about Jesus' deity here. He forever has been and forever will be God. Rather, Paul is talking about something new concerning his role as the Messiah. And I think the key to understanding this is that phrase, in power. He's declared to be the Son of God in power. And that little prepositional phrase does not describe the declaring or the appointing. Like, he was powerfully declared. Like, really bigly de declared, right? No. It describes the Son of God. Through his resurrection, God appointed his son to be the powerful son of God, the son of God in power. Paul is talking about, about Jesus' enthronement as the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And where might Paul have gotten that idea from? Well, it's from the passage we read earlier to call us to worship from Psalm 2. In response to the raging nations, what does Yahweh do? As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. The Lord responds to the world's rebellion by declaring that he is installing his son, his chosen king on the throne. And when did this enthronement happen? Well, Paul tells us in that other passage we read later. That Jerry read, Acts 13, verse 33. God has fulfilled the promise to us, their children, by raising Jesus. As also it is written in the second psalm, you are my son. Today, I have begotten you. Peter echoed the same truth in his sermon at Pentecost, according to Acts 2. That because of Jesus' resurrection from the dead, God has made him both Lord and Christ. You might think of it this way. Before Jesus was resurrected from the dead, he was the son of God in weakness and lowliness. Not that he himself was intrinsically weak, but that he lived among our weakness. He lived 
among the poor and lowly. He even suffered the humiliation of death itself. He was the Son of God in weakness, but through His resurrection, God appointed Him to be the Son of God in power, never to die again. And Jesus' enthronement, Paul says, is according to the Spirit. He's ushered in this new age of the Spirit, the age of God's salvation, through His resurrection. So friends, when Jesus walked out of His tomb, it's like the old age of sin and death stayed in the tomb through the Spirit. You know what I'm saying? Like th- he's ushering in, in an entirely new age. You say, John, like it doesn't feel like that at all. And you're right. It sure doesn't sometimes. The presence of sin and evil is pervasive in our world. Death and suffering stalk us at every ter- turn. But beloved, there's coming a day when Jesus will come again to claim the full victory that he has won. That's why we understand his reign to be already, but but not yet. In his death and resurrection, Jesus paid sin's penalty. He broke sin's power for all those united him by faith. And one day our king will return and he will annihilate the presence of sin and its curse forever. And all those united to this triumphant king by faith will reign right along with him. Now you say, John, that is... That's a lot of great theology, right? I'm sure glad that we covered that, but like, what's the application, man? Sometimes the exposition of the text, friends, becomes its own application. Sometimes. Because when I read this text, I think that our response is to just let our knees bow before this king, let our jaws hit the floor, marveling in staggered silence at the powerful reign of King Jesus, our risen King. And then rise and worship with a full heart and a loud voice, the God whose gospel rescues sinners like us who repent and believe. Christ, the true and better David, lowly shepherd, mighty King, He the champion in the battle, where, O death, is now thy sting. In our place he bled and conquered. Crown him Lord of majesty. His shall be the throne forever. We shall ere his people be. Amen. Amen. From beginning to end, Christ the story. His the glory. Hallelujah. Amen. I think if I'm understanding the flow of this passage, most of the application comes in these next few verses and in my final two and much briefer points of the sermon. (laughs) Number two, God's aim for his gospel. God's aim for his gospel. Paul writes in verse five, through whom, through the resurrected son, the Lord Jesus Christ, we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Friends, why did God or set Paul apart for his gospel? Why is this good news of God saving reign through the resurrected Jesus? What, why is it there? What is it aimed at? What's our own evangelism and missions efforts for? Paul says it's for the obedience of faith among all nations. Friends, here's why I opened the sermon the way that I did, because Paul says that the good and right response to God's good news of King Jesus' saving reign is that you obey it through faith in Him. God's gospel is aimed at the obedience of faith. That's kind of an unusual term, isn't it? The obedience of faith. Is Paul talking about the obedience that comes from faith, kind of like James does? Well, even though it's ultimately, you know, we know that it's ultimately Christ's obedience that saves us, not our own obedience. It's faith in his obedience. The entire New Testament presses home the fact that if we have true faith, we will have true obedience. That will follow. Obedience will follow faith. But more than that, here, Paul is talking about the only right response to Jesus being installed as the king. He's the Lord of all. What's the only right response? The obedience of faith. All people have a responsibility to obey King Jesus by trusting in King Jesus. He's talking about the obedience that is faith. The obedience of faith. The obedience that is faith. 
Turn quickly to, over to Romans 10.16. Flip over there, Romans 10, 16. Let's look at a couple passages that back this up, okay? Romans 10, 16. Paul writes in Romans 10, 16, but not all have what? Obeyed the gospel. Now over to Romans 15, 18. Keep your finger flipping, okay? Now over to Romans 15, 18. Paul writes... For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience. Friends, God's good news is aimed at your bowed knee. It's aimed at your humbled heart. It's aimed at your surrendered life to him. Jesus is not your, your friendly neighborhood superhero. <laughs> through his resurrection from the dead, God has exalted him as Lord of the cosmos. And so the only right and good response to his lordship is for you to turn from your sin and rebellion against God and trust in his work alone to save you. So often we think of bad news as the news to which we need to submit and obey, right? I got a notice in the mail a few weeks ago. It said that my car registration is due by the end of February. And before I can, you know, register my car online, I actually have to go and get an emissions test because my car is old, I guess, you know. that Great. I, I consider that bad news. <laughs> I don't want to do that. It's a waste of my time, right? You filled out your tax return wrong, buddy. Submit this form or be subject to a penalty. That's, that's bad news that I need to obey. But here comes our God with the greatest news that could ever be imagined, that you and I can be reconciled to him instead of spending an eternity separated from him in hell as the just consequence of our rebellion. It's a free gift. You can't self-atone for it. You can't work for it through your own best efforts or intentions. You know, it, it, it's free. It'd be like it'd be like Publishers Clearinghouse. Does that still exist? That was the thing from my childhood. That's how you got a lot of money, right? You just register. Like it'd be like Publishers Clearinghouse sweepstakes showing up on your front door saying, "Congratulations, you run. You won the grand prize, fifty million dollars." But you have to accept that prize on our terms. You, you got to fill out this form. You got to come to this place. You got to get it in these installments. I mean. Who in their right mind would say, nah, I'll pass? I'd rather receive those the, that, that free gift of 50 mil on my terms. God's grace is free, but it is costly. It costs Jesus his life to secure your salvation, and it will cost you your life to receive it. You must bow the knees of your life and heart to the King and then rise to follow him by faith. But friends, if you do, you'll receive from Jesus' hand everything that God has created you for, eternal life with him forever. God's gospel is aimed at the obedience of faith among the nations. Now the whole world, not just the Jews, now the whole world receives the salvation promised to Israel. Why? Because the true Israel, Israel's true king, has fulfilled God's promises to Abraham and now brought blessing to the nations. And all of this, Paul writes in verse 5, is for the glory of Jesus. You see that? That little phrase, for the sake of his name. You might say it's for the sake of his reputation. Paul's motivation what made him tick was not ultimately the, the obedience of the nations for their own sake. You know, as, as important as the motivation of compassion for the lost is about their, their plight of suffering in hell eternally, that is not our ultimate motivation in evangelism. The ultimate goal is the glory of Jesus, his renown over all the earth, that Jesus' name be magnified as it ought to be by the nations of the earth. Our salvation his renown, our forgiveness, his praise, our good, his glory. Number three, our abundance in his gospel. Our abundance in his gospel. In Paul's stream of thought, he calls the believers in the churches in Rome to recognize that they are included among the nations whom the gospel has called to obedience. He wants them to understand that then the aim of his ministry as an apostle, as well as the purposes of God and the gospel, includes the likes of them. Look at the end of verse 6. He says, including you. 
who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, you ready for some amazingly encouraging truth this morning? The same sovereign call that summoned Paul into his office as an apostle, it also summons people to part with their sin and submit to Jesus, their Savior and King. Again, this this word called isn't a take it or leave it invitation. It is a sovereign, reality-changing call. Of course, friends, every time the gospel is proclaimed, it includes a general call to, to all to repent and believe. But the clear teaching of the scripture is that some will hear, as it were, the spirit of Christ Jesus calling their name to come to him. It's what happened to each one of us in this room that are believers. All of a sudden, where before our hearts were, were cold to Jesus, all of a sudden it strangely warmed to him. Whereas before, we looked at the gospel and found it dull and even offensive, but all of a sudden we find it beautiful and compelling. You see, this effectual call, as the theologians call it, it dovetails with the gift of the new birth. This call is the means by which our dead hearts are made alive and we are brought into a right relationship with God. Friends, think about the confidence this should give you in your evangelism. Just like I'm sure it gave Paul confidence in his ministry. We Through the gospel, we proclaim this crucified and resurrected king. We show people their need to repent and believe in Jesus. And when we do, God will call some to the obedience of faith. And guess what happens when they do? Just like verse 6 says, they'll belong to Jesus. I think it's clear in the flow of Paul's thought here that to belong to Jesus is to be loved by God and called to be his saints, his holy ones. You ever wonder why, why Paul begins his letters like this? Why did, he, why did he begin Romans like this? Why didn't he just say to all those in Rome, howdy, right? Why the other descriptors? Well, surely it's that Paul wants them to conceive of their primary identity in terms of their relationship with God through Christ. No longer is their primary identity Roman citizen. Subject of the Caesar Nero. No, their primary identity was their relationship to their creator through his son. Fundamentally, friends, these Roman believers didn't belong to Caesar. They belonged to Jesus, the king. The king of kings and lord of lords who gave their, his life for them in order to possess them in love. Brothers and sisters, Paul is pointing out that something radical and amazing happened when you were converted. Your fundamental identity is no longer in relation to your sin. Your fundamental identity is no longer in relation to your struggle or even your suffering, but in relationship to your God. You belong to Christ Jesus. You are loved by God. You are called to be his holy ones. Some of you, friends, lean to let this truth just settle on your heart this morning. Hear the words of Paul to those in Goodyear and Buckeye and Avondale and Litchfield Park, and Surprise, who are loved by God and called to be his saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And since you are loved by God, as his child, his unmerited kindness is yours. He has brought you into a relationship of peace with him. God has laid the weapons of his justice down since Christ took the blow of his justice on the cross. All that God has for you now is his grace and peace. Even the trials of your life are designed to bring you into a deeper experience of God's grace and peace. The father of the son is now the father of all those who belong to the son. And God loves you like he loves his son. Um, many years ago, I remember hearing my pastor in Louisville, Greg, preach texts like this, and he would say something to the effect of, and just kind of illustrating it for the, the congregation and explaining, he would say, it's not merely that you belong to Jesus by right, 
It's not merely that you're God's child by right through Christ's work. Because you're God's child by right, God is passionately engaged toward your good. And, and then Greg would, he would give the example of his children. He said, it's not just that my children belong to me. It's like my heart roars for their, for their good and well-being. I will move heaven and earth to protect and ensure the good of my kids. And I remember hearing that type of thing before I had kids, you know, and I thought, oh, that is so sweet. Oh, Greg must be a good dad. But then once you have kids, you realize how true it is. Like, he's right. My heart roars for the good of Hadley, Cooper, and Canaan. God helping me, I will not let them go. God helping me, I'm not going to harm them intentionally. I'm always going to work for their good. Why? Because they're mine. And I love them. Friends, think how much more it must be with our God. We sang earlier of the roaring lion of the tribe of Judah who conquered the grave. Well, the ferocity of that triumph is for your sake and mine. If you're Jesus's through faith in him, Jesus this morning roars for your good. He has Purchase your redemption. He has forgiven your sin. He has conquered your grave. And he will move heaven and earth to bring you home. Friends, what a great start to the greatest letter ever written. May God so help us to live in the abundance of his gospel and proclaim it to all who need to hear. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we praise you this morning for your work on our behalf and we exalt you to the rightful place that you now occupy. You are our King and our God and we worship you this morning. Cause our hearts not only to rejoice in this gospel, but as we have obeyed it through faith initially, to keep obeying it, to live in it through faith and to proclaim it to those who desperately need to hear it. We ask that you would do your work among us, even as we go through this series over the next months and years, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.